timeline. And uh, if you don't get a notice, please put a notice on your calendar today. Uh, to please go online and pay your dues uh, at the end of the year. If you have any questions on that, don't hesitate to contact uh, Heather Kincaid, our executive director. Uh, she'll be glad to help you uh, through the process. So there again, thanks for all the members of have renewed. The organization is only as good as our membership and our membership uh, has been faithful and we certainly appreciate that. And we go back over the many years uh, that everyone has supported in their way. Uh, and some it might be time-wise, some it might be monetarily. Uh, so we certainly appreciate that. I did want to take a minute to thank all our sponsors, our platinum sponsor, Laona, uh, for standing up uh, this year and standing tall with uh, their donation and sponsorship, uh, Corgal Tanks, uh, RMS, our local 130, our local 105 up in DC and Se Seattle Rainwater. Thank all of you for uh, your corporate sponsorship of the conference. We certainly appreciate it. And thanks for your continued support. Part of the thing that's really presented a challenge for us this year, especially budget-wise, is because of the virus, we have not been able to do any in-person training this year. Our in-person training is normally a pretty sizable amount of our budget. Unfortunately, this year, due to the virus, obviously, we have not been able to do that. So that has presented a, somewhat of a challenge for us budget-wise. We are moving forward to several other things we're going to talk about here and how we can uh, compensate that for that going into 2021. And that is some of the things that we've done in our next slide here, Jim, with uh, our online ASSE certification. And all that's been moving forward this year. It's been a tremendous amount of effort from everyone on the committee and on the educational committee to come up with uh, our online training that we're working on. As you can see here, we've got that completed and should be up uh, in January and February, three of the initial online certification workshops uh, where our designer, installer, and recertification. So for all you uh, APs and people who have gotten your ASSE certification to do your recertification, uh, you will be able to follow through with that after the first of the year. Uh, we're also working on the uh, online inspection workshop. We think this is a, a big opportunity for us to help e educate uh, people across the country uh, and some of the challenges we've had with rainwater harvesting and getting systems approved in different municipalities for lack of a general overall standard in the U.S. Uh, this is an important aspect we believe will help uh, with promoting the rainwater harvesting and rainwater harvesting in a good way by having the inspectors educated about what they should look for when they receive a design or when they show up on a job site and take a look at our rainwater system. One of the biggest things that's really helped launch that forward, uh, and I think Bob Bulware and a lot of other people that were involved in ASPE uh, for their uh, co-sponsoring uh, with us, the Standard 63 and Standard 78 uh, in the past year or so, the Standard 63 was brought up for review and has been uh, put back out there again. Uh, there were a few changes to that. You can see those online, or you can download that from ARCSA or ASPE to get the current copy of your standard 63. Standard 78 on our stormwater and uh, uh, guidelines for standard 78, uh, we've started that to revamp that, uh, look at recertification on that with uh, what's going on in the stormwater side of capture. That committee has been formed. Uh, it will start uh, the first of the year with meetings. Um, and they do have a committee formed right now. However, I do believe if you are interested, you're in that stormwater side and would like to be involved in that committee, uh, please uh, let Heather know. Uh, that's a big part of what's going on in the country, especially with MS4 and, and the capture of uh, our runoff. And with the tremendous year that we've had this year, I think it's more important and people are paying attention to the amount of flooding that we've had across the U.S the amount of hurricanes, the amount of weather change that we're experiencing has really added to the catastrophic events that we had, the fires in California. Uh, it's just been a challenging year for everyone, but some of these efforts are certainly gonna lend to um, compensating for that and also uh, taking care of our renewable resources and taking care of stormwater runoff that's causing some of these uh, catastrophic things. So many people have lost their homes, 
so many businesses have closed due to drought, flooding, and uh, fire, as well as uh, the pandemic shutting businesses down. So what a historic and challenging year it has been. So these things are very important. And to move that standard 78, uh, we're excited about it. And uh, please pay attention to that. And always look at your e-news. Uh, Heather's constantly doing updates every month on what's going on with the uh, standards. We do talk about it every month at the uh, meetings that we have for the board, what's going on with the codes. I ask everyone to continue to share these, this information on standards and what's going on in, as far as codes and res, uh, regulations in your area and what's going on locally, because that's very important for us to share with the rest of the country and give everyone an opportunity to see what others are doing, what's working and what's not in the industry. One of the other things that we started this year, uh, certainly wasn't just because of the fact that the virus caused the budget, a little bit of a budget crunch, but something we worked on in the past, we have had some success in, but needed to move forward with, and that is uh, fundraising by grants. So we did actually uh, link up with a professional organization. Heather's been submitting uh, uh, applications for this across the board to different organizations. So I asked that if you know any of any organization or any foundation that might be interesting in funding by grants to the organization to please let Heather know. And let's continue to give Heather our support in submitting those grant applications. And hopefully we'll start hearing back on some of those uh, in 2021. It does take time to get these kind of things started. So uh, it, it's been a, a long year for her to put a lot of that out. Uh, and to put these together, it is a time consuming uh, effort, uh, but she's doing a good job of getting it out there and she's learning the process. Uh, so one thing that Neil Sapir always threw out is, uh, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for today. If you teach him how to fish, he can eat forever. So hopefully the investment that we've made in the grants uh, and, and the opportunity to work with this group is teaching Heather how she continue to do this as our executive director now and in the future as we move forward. The ARSA Foundation has published several articles this year. One of the things that the foundation set as a goal was to try and get as many articles out there in the community to educate people about rainwater harvesting. A lot of those articles have been published this year. Normally you'll find a, uh, a link to those articles on your e-news, so please pay attention to that. Any articles that you might see in your local paper there again, uh, are magazines that, that you're, uh, read on a regular basis, please share those with the group so that we can share those with the members of the organization. And it's all about education, education. I think we've been saying that forever, uh, you know, over my 20 years of being in the business, certainly uh, I think that's the biggest challenge that we have and that we'll continue to have for many years to come is to educate people about what's going on with the uh, rainwater harvesting community and how we can mitigate uh, our water sources with that. So please share all that information and send it on over. Part of what the uh, foundation also did was a survey uh, with the group uh, and our education, some of the things that we could offer. Hopefully you'll hear some things about that. We do have uh, quite a few good speakers lined up, uh, all good ones actually, and I'm anxious to, to hear them. And, David, you hit your mute button by mistake. David, you're on mute. David, you're on mute. David, you're mute. Please turn on your microphone. I, I didn't push that button, but somebody else did, but that's okay. Now, can you hear me? How about a nod from somebody? All right, there we go. David. So you want to start over from the beginning or where did we lose out? <laughs> Just the last 30 seconds. All right, that sounds good then. 
Well, we were, I was talking about the foundation and publishing the articles and I assume that's what we lost out on. So there again, um, if you didn't hear it, please share any local articles that you might have with the organization and the members and uh, keep that educational process moving forward. So as far as the uh, UA training, one of the things that the UA has done is, as well as be a great supporter of the organization uh, financially as well as uh, knowledge is the UA has set a national training program out that we were able to work in agreement with and donated $3,000 to this project to ARCSA so that the UA will have a national training program in each of their facilities across the U.S. as they roll that out in 2021. I'd like to thank Kurt and all the others that have been involved with that uh, for, for bringing that forward. There is a lot of business out in Seattle and Portland. Those groups have been very instrumental in this. Uh, the Seattle and Portland group are uh, hoping to certify at least 500 trainees over the next uh, 24 months in their area in the rainwater harvesting ASSE certification for rainwater uh, installers. So that's quite an effort. And we really appreciate that. La Una, again, this year has stepped up as our main sponsor for the conference. We want to thank them again for their continued support. Uh, we really appreciate it. I uh, don't know what we would have done without our supporting members and the sponsors that have helped us over the last uh, four or five years to grow the organization, to keep our budget moving forward. I also want to take this time to thank all the board members all the people that have worked on the committees. Uh, last night I started to put together a list and I thought, wow, it's just too many to name. Uh, so I, I, I'm not gonna name everybody, you know who you are. Please check on the list, check on the website. You can see who some of these people are on the committees, but thank you all so much for all your uh, hard work and dedication and time that you've donated to the organization this year. So not to keep us from being late, I had one other announcement in the opening that I'd like to talk to, and this is uh, this is a guy that's really done a lot for our organization. I'd like to congratulate, and I'm I'm sorry I'm not in person where I can give you a hug and a handshake, Rocco, but the Lifetime Achievement Award this year goes to uh, Rocco Davis. Rocco, congratulations! It's uh, well deserved. I was going to read your bio here. Yes, congratulations, Rocco, and. Uh, but your bio is so long and you're on so many committees and done so many things. I knew I would run out of time and I didn't have the 15 minutes this morning, Rocco, but thank you so much for everything that you've done for our organization and continue to do everything that Lyona has done for our organization, all your time involved and your expertise and your scholarly manner that you've brought to the organization. Despite what your uh, wife might say, I think you're a gentleman and a scholar and we appreciate it. Thanks, David. Yeah, I'm going to turn this back over to uh, to Jim Woods, and we're going to start the conference and thank everyone this morning. It's a pleasure being here. I also would like to thank everyone for all the get well wishes that they uh, sent to me this year. It'll be one week. Uh, uh, will be the annual anniversary of my horrific accident that I was in. It was quite the experience, and so uh, I spent last Christmas in the hospital got back to work in February and I have really enjoyed number one, not being on any airplanes this year, to be honest with you. Uh, so it has been a challenge, but uh, don't miss that. But uh, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be back at work and uh, thrilled to see everyone who's got their viewers on today. Wish we were in person, but uh, I hopefully next year we'll be in person again. And I certainly look forward to that. I want to thank all the speakers who are uh, going to speak during the conference and there again, all the committee members and everyone, and especially the conference committee who worked diligently all through the year to put this together for our virtual conference. So thank you so much. And we'll turn that over to Christy, who will be introducing our uh, first presenter today. Perfect. Uh, thank you, David. Hope y'all can hear me. I'm very excited to be here and thank you all for joining us. I want to announce our first speaker, James Beecham. He is president of Texas Drinking Water Solutions. Um, he also was part of TCQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality for over 28 years. Um, and so he worked during that time to spearhead a lot of initiatives with TCQ to allow rainwater harvesting to be utilized for public water supplies. 
Um, so today he is going to talk to us about rainwater. He's going to give us some insight to what TCEQ will require uh, regarding using rainwater as a public water supply. Um, and we're gonna get that going shortly. I also want to mention as we present our speakers today at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse, you will see a chat icon. On that chat icon, if you click on it, it will allow you to type in any questions. So you can send us questions at real time. And at the end of our presentation, we will answer those questions. We'll also allow you to speak, but sometimes it's just easier to have you type those questions. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to James Beecham. Thank you, Christy. And uh, thank you, Jim and Heather for having me today. And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, looking forward to our, our discussion today. So uh, like I said, the, this presentation is about rainwater harvesting and, and drinking water and how those two relate and the the TCQ uh, regulations associated with uh, rainwater and how it's treated and handled. Uh, so just a little bit on the introduction, I'll have a, a background, go over, you know, TCQ regulations, that type of thing. And I talk about some general requirements in the collection and treatment uh, requirements as well, uh, storage and distribution, and uh, of course, minimum capacity requirements that uh, TCQ, TCQ requires as far as, you know, your size of your water storage tanks, you know, your service pumps, pressure tanks, all your equipment. Uh, operations and maintenance, uh, that's required, that includes your monitoring requirements once you're approved as a public water system. And uh, drink, of course, drinking water quality issues associated with the, you know, the treatment of rainwater and or service water. And then we'll end up with some questions, uh, hopefully. Okay, the, the Texas Commission on Environmental Qualities rules for public drinking water only apply to a public water system that supplies rainwater as potable water. So that's maybe a little confusing, but uh, it's for anybody that supplies any type of a source uh, of water, whether it be groundwater, surface water. Basically, if you meet the definition of a public water system, you're regulated. But for today's purposes, we'll be focusing obviously on rainwater uh, as, a, as a potable water source. So this presentation, like I said, offers a general overview of the TCQ rules that apply to public water systems that use rainwater as drinking water. And they can use that whether it's a uh, drinking water has a, a lot of uh, uses and I'll go over that as well. But and it also includes food manufacturing facilities and as a uh, source for commercial bottling. So if you're a water bottling operation and you have your own source of water that is regulated by TCEQ. So uh, harvested rainwater is classified as surface water that can either be land based or roof based. And of course, as most of you are aware, land-based rainwater harvesting is when rainwater runoff uh, is collected on the land surface and, uh, and it goes into impoundments or, you know, larger uh, surface water impoundments, you know, such as lakes, streams, that type of thing. And it reaches a water course, river, stream. Roof-based is uh, what most of this industry is uh, involved with. And it's uh, when rainwater that falls is collected on a roof before the water reaches the ground. So those are pretty straightforward. But... Uh, so part of the uh, TCQ's requirements, they consider uh, you know, rainwater to be surface water. So uh, it does require regulation. And uh, so just so you'll know, I mean, the, the public, you, you need to know first what the public water system definition is. So what, it, this is all hinges on whether you're a public water system, whether or not you're regulated by TCQ uh, for uh, rainwater or groundwater or whatever. So it's a system, the definition of a public water system is a system for the provision to the public of water for human consumption, that's a uh, definition in itself, through pipes or other constructed conveyances, which also includes the uses described under the definition for drinking water. So those two are interconnected, human consumption and drinking water. And uh, the key to this, for you to be considered or regulated as a public water system, and this is the EPA, uh, 40 CFR definition and the TCQ definition under chapter 290. Uh, and it's you either serve 15 service connections or you serve 25 individuals at least 60 days out of the year. Uh, we have a lot of questions about what does that 60 days mean? And that's not consecutive days. That could be any 60 days out of the year. So if you have 15 service connections, which means a building, a, a connection is a building, an RV. So if you have a, a hundred uh, slot RV park, 
a uh, hundred pad RV park, then you've got a hundred units or connections. Same thing with residential uh, homes. If you have 15 uh, homes, then that's, that's each one of those is a connection. So you have to serve at least 15 connections or you serve 25 individuals at least 60 days out of the year. Now, for a community water system, that's pretty straightforward. You know, most of you uh, uh, obtain your water from a community water source, whether it be city, a water supply corporation, or other type of a uh, larger uh, water system. But there are actually very small water systems that only serve, you know, maybe 50 people. But if they meet that definition, they are regulated by the TCEQ. So drinking water, here's a couple of the definitions as well. All water distributed by an agency or individual, public or private, for the purpose of human consumption, or which may be used in the preparation of foods or beverages, or for the cleaning of any utensil, using the course of preparation or consumption of food or beverages for human beings. So then the term drinking water also includes water supply for human consumption. So those, those two, when you look at the 290 rules, those two definitions kind of refer back to each other. But essentially, uh, drinking water and human consumption uh, here's the definition for human consumption. Uh, basically, any water uses by humans in which water can be ingested into or absorbed by the human body. So all these examples include, these are not, these are just, uh, they're not limited to these, but drinking, cooking, uh, brushing teeth, bathing, washing hands, washing dishes, and, and preparing foods. So when I was at TCQ, I know we regulated a lot of uh, water bottling facilities. And uh, just the fact that, you know, you might say, well, maybe they've only got 20 employees or you know 20 employees there that in itself that facility may, I know this sounds kind of confusing but that the facility itself may not be a public water system but the fact they're bottling water for the for the masses and that water is regulated because of that reason so the TCQ's design and operational regulations fall under like I said 30 uh, Texas Administra administrative code chapter 290 and they are to ensure that a public water system can supply their customers with adequate quantities of potable drinking water at low rates that meet their needs. So that's why TCQ has capacities, you know, not only the treatment requirements, but they have also capacity requirements that you have to be able to not only provide potable water and treat it adequately, but you have to be able to provide enough of that water. So quantity and quantity are both uh, written into the rules. And then of course the TCQ requires a written letter, of any plans for a public water system to use rainwater source for drinking water. And like I said, that not, not only includes uh, rainwater, but includes groundwater and or service water sources. Uh, we have a lot of systems I know that we've developed that are actually hauled water systems and uh, TCQ regulates those as well. But they actually use an approved water hauler from TCQ uh, or a TCQ approved water hauler and that water is then delivered to the facility. And most of those top facilities are, are systems that uh, you know, don't or it may not be feasible to drill a well at that location due to water quality or uh, you know just the cost associated and they may not be using that much water to begin with so they may want to go with just a what we term as a hauled water system so they're still regulated because they're actually serving enough customers at that location or that business but their water source is actually brought in from another uh, you know let's say a city or something like that so they're bringing already treated water into that facility and the, and delivering it to the storage tank. But that facility that uses that water is actually regulated uh, as a public water system as well. So just some general requirements. Of course, any plans for the construction and completion of a public water system, those have to be submitted by a, a licensed professional engineer that's licensed in the state of Texas. Of course, they have to submit an engineering report, plans and specifications to this TCQ just so they can, and they'll look at it and they review it. So they, they want to be able to sure, uh, ensure that the, whether it's a business or you know, a community water system, they can uh, uh, reliably supply an adequate, and, uh, adequately treated drinking water. So, uh, and like I said, they, they kind of have a, a two phase process. They have a construction and completion phase. So you typically submit plans for construction. Those are approved, then you, you uh, then you actually install the water system and you have to turn around depending on your source for sure the engineer turns around and submits you know plans again to the tcq basic concurrence saying that uh, the water system was installed in accordance with the initial plans so that entire process and depending on what you're looking at uh you're looking at, at least 60 days 
per process. So most of the time you're looking at about a six month time frame to get a, a, an approved source and to get your facilities approved through TCEQ. That's, it can be longer depending on if you have to have any rule exceptions, but generally you're probably looking at about close to a six month process. So under collection and treatment. So rainfall of course varies significantly across Texas and the design of each collection system must be evaluated on a site specific basis. So as TCQ uh, looks at your, your rainwater source, depending on your collection, you know, if you've got a, you know, a large building, small, whatever that you have, they're going to look and try to categorize uh, you know, and, and assess your water source based on maybe what region you're in. So for instance, they, they look at every, so when you have a, let's say you're gonna build a surface water treatment plant that's pulling from Lake XYZ. Well, they're gonna they're gonna make you a, they're gonna require that you assess that water, you know, in that lake, uh, you know, do a raw water quality assessment to determine if there's any other additional treatment other than maybe conventional or you know pretty much typical type treatment is required. So if you have you know maybe you have some contaminants in that uh, water source that that may not be uh, or may be indicative to a, a specific area, they want you to uh, basically do a raw uh, water analysis and you know do an assessment of your your source water. And that will drive what type of treatment processes are required for that particular source. They're going to do the same with rainwater. Um, I know it sounds, everybody thinks that rainwater is, is pristine, and it is, for the most part, but when it hits the roof, or maybe a different type of roof, it may have some other, maybe your roof is, you know, aged or something like that, and you may have some leaching of other, you know, maybe coatings or something. They're going to look at that. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you know, your collection system is very important. And uh, so, they also want you, uh, you know, they, the collection system should be designed also, or also designed so that the first part of each rainfall is collected in a separate storage tank for non-potable use or discard. So that's something to think about. Uh, I know a lot of, uh, you know, uh, water impoundments and like, uh, for like, uh, if you have like a water quality pond for service runoff, a lot of those water quality ponds, let's say it's on a parking lot of a, a major store, you have a huge parking lot. Well, that a lot of times those uh, water quality per, or water quality requirements for an impoundment they require you to capture the first or that surface water impoundment water quality pond is required to collect at least the first half inch, quarter inch, half inch of rain, depending on where you're at. Some cities, you know, uh, or authorities may be more uh, stringent depending on what the requirements are. But typically, they want you to collect that first major uh, flow off that maybe the first quarter inch off of a impoundment and then start using that water afterward to uh, use for treated water. A specialized treatment facil uh, facilities rather than standard or conventional design standards are needed to treat rainwater for potable use. And that's like I said, TCQ uh, considers uh, rainwater as service water. So they're gonna apply the same standards to a service water treatment plant uh, to rainwater. So an exception, and like I mentioned earlier, you may also have to file for exceptions, and that depends on uh, what type of treatment process you're looking at. Uh, but for any type of system that TCQ deems is innovative, which they require, they consider rainwater treatment as innovative. So you would have to, you know, file an exception first, just to say, hey, we're going to use this type of treatment, you know, for the rainwater, the rain, uh, collected rainwater. So they would require an exception anyway. Well, uh, that, that process typically requires another 100 days. So you're looking at 100 days up front just to file the exception for the type of treatment unit that you're proposing for rainwater. And then you, you, know, then you send in your plan. So you're adding another uh, 120 days after that. So like I said, six months is a, a pretty good rule of thumb when it comes to the time frame involved with uh, receiving TCQ approval for plans and exceptions for, for treatment of this type of source. So like I said, most designs will use a filter that's capable of removing at least 99% of particles, the three microns or larger in, in diameter. And you have to have a disinfection system. Uh, and you may use chlorine, ozone, or ultraviolet, ultraviolet light that's capable of inactivating at least 99.99%, which is four log of the viruses, or that four log treatment of the viruses that might be present in the untreated water and provide a residual disinfectant level. So we get a lot of questions about people that are, uh, they ask about, okay, well, can we use uh, 
ozone, ultra, or especially UV. We have a lot of questions about people thinking uh, or asking the question, can they use UV instead of chlorine? Uh, they can for part of the treatment, and they will get credit through TCQ to, uh, you know, to inactivate viruses. Uh, so they'll get some credit for that. However, ultimately, they're going to have to maintain a, a residual disinfectant level, which is going to be chlorine, in their distribution system. So regardless of how they treat that water and receive the, you know, the proper inactivation credits through TCQ to say, okay, that source is treated, but now we still have to maintain a disinfectant or residual disinfectant level in the distribution system. So uh, ultimately, you're going to wind up using chlorine at some point in that treatment process. And like I said, you may be able to use UV initially, but at some point, you're going to have to inject or you know utilize chlorine as well. So obviously, your system you have to have enough quantity to meet the customer's maximum daily demands any time of the year. So in bottling rainwater requires that all TCQ treatment requirements are met before the water enters the bottling process. Any treatment during bottling must occur after the water has already been deemed fit for human consumption. Okay, so that's a, that's a big question that we've received a, a lot of input on as well. So if you, let's say you have a bottle, water bottling facility and you're using rainwater as your source, you can, the water has to meet TCQ standards prior to the bottling process. Now, if you choose to remove the chlorine, that's that's fine, but it has to meet those standards prior to that particular uh, point of treatment. So you may have to add chlorine, you know, to meet all TCQ requirements as far as, you know, viral inactivation, crypto, GRD inactivation. Uh, then you can turn around and remove chlorine. You may run it through an RO system, that type of thing before it's bottled. That happens a lot. And, uh, but just, that's what that means is that you have to meet the, the TCQ requirements prior to any additional treatment, you know, for cleaning it up to, you know, that you want to put in, you know, before bottling occurs. So log reduction, I know we talked about that 99.99% removal. That's actually a four log and basically log reduction is just a terminology, is a way to express levels of decreased back biological contamination in, in water by factors of 10 that can easily be converted to percent reduction. So log reduction relates to the percentage of microorganisms physically removed through filtration or inactivated through disinfection by a given process. Uh, so that can happen either way. You can physically remove, uh, you know, some microorganisms through filtration, some you can't, and then or inactivated through disinfection. So most of the treatment process are going to include both of these, filtration and disinfection. So just to give you an idea, one log reduction, it's a logarithmic scale, and uh, some of you probably already know this, but one log reduction means you're removing, or you have 99, 90, I'm sorry, 90% removal or inactivation. Two log is 99% removal or inactivation of microorganisms. Three log is 99.9%, and so on. Four log is 99.99%. That's removal or inactivation of virus or uh, microorganisms. So why is this important? So the, the presence of microbiological pathogens in public water supplies is a health concern, of course. The purpose of the surface water treatment rules is to reduce the illnesses caused by pathogens in drinking water. And that's why TCQ requires this treatment for rainwater collection systems. So disease-causing pathogens include Legionella, Giardia, Lamia, and Cryptosporidium. These are the main, or not, not so much Legionella, but I mean, that's, that's a part of it, but you're looking at when your TCQ requires uh, log removal for viruses, Giardia, and crypto. That's in rule, and uh, of course, that when you're treating for that and you're disinfecting, usually Legionella will hopefully not be an issue. So Legionella, of course, Legionella bacterium also causes the Pontiac fever, and it's a it's a milder disease. It's, it's kind of like the flu, of course, and uh, it usually can clear on its own. But if you untreated, Legionnaires obviously get can be fatal. Uh, and Legionella bacteria can multiply in water systems, uh, maybe humans. And most of those, I know that you probably heard the, what started all this, Legionnaires Conference years ago, and uh, it was in the air conditioning system. So it's uh, air, uh, waterborne, I mean airborne, and it's passed through uh, droplets. So uh, that infected, we had quite a few deaths. I can't remember the exact number, but I know they had, uh, it was a very serious issue, and that's what heightened the awareness of Legionella and uh, those type of uh, 
water systems. So prevention uh, requires water management systems and buildings that ensure the water is monitored and clean and disinfected regularly. So Giardia is a microscopic parasite that causes the diarrheal illness known as giardiasis, giardiasis. Giardia is found on surfaces or in the soil, food or water, and it has been contaminated with feces from infected humans or animals. Giardia is protected by an outer shell that allows it to survive outside the body for long periods of time and makes it tolerant to chlorine disinfection. While the parasite can be spread in different ways, drinking water and recreational is the most common mode of transmission. So that's why when you start looking at these pathogens, uh, pathogenic organisms, you know, TC, you see why filtration and then disinfection is required because uh, Giardia, you know, it's, it's resistant because this has a harder outer shell, same way with crypto. So they're basically crypto and giardia or, or critters, if you will. And uh, they require physical removal. You know, viruses are, are, are chlorine is highly effective on viruses. So it, it doesn't require uh, filtration to, to remove those. Disinfection, a chlorine disinfection is highly effective on, uh, on viruses. Crypto's freedom. So it can be adjusted uh, you know, by, you know, it comes in through your mouth, uh, cryptosporidiosis. Uh, cryptosporidium infection begins when one cell of cryptosporidium parasites get into your body through your mouth. The parasite is difficult to get rid of because it's resistant to many disinfectants and many filters don't remove it. So you have to have a certain size filter. So that's the same thing for crypto and giardia. Well, that's why crypto is a little more of a concern, it's just because it's a little harder to to filter. There are, there's plenty of filtration systems out there that can remove it. You just have to have the correct one. And there's a wide variety of, of filtration uh, that's out there and I've seen a lot of really good systems. It's just not something you can pick up most of the time off your local hardware store shelf. So design and storage. Okay. Uh, so does, uh, storage and distribution, sorry. Christy and I are talking about the time right now. The design and construction of the water storage and distribution facilities must meet the standards adopted by AWWA, American Water Works Association. So all your tanks, all your, uh, all your tanks and everything have to meet the AWWA uh, requirements. ANSI NSF 61 for your storage tanks and course chemicals have to meet NSF ANSI 60 for uh, chemical additives. Excuse me, is that how much time we've got? We have 21. So TCQ design requirements for storage and distribution systems are located in 30 Texas Administrative Code 290, 43, and 44. Of course, the TCQ requires that all treated water be disinfected before entering the storage tank and to maintain a disinfectant residual in the tank and throughout the distribution system. So going back to some of those treatment processes, there are a lot of great ones that are out there. UV, ozone, there are a lot of tremendous effective treatment systems out there, just keep in mind that ultimately you will have to keep a disinfectant residual, which is going to be most of the time it's going to be chlorine in your distribution system. So at some point, even though you may have UV and ozone uh, to treat rainwater, at some point you will have to have a chlorine residual, you know, chlorine disinfecting equipment to maintain a residual in your distribution system. And a distribution system is basically once it leaves your treatment plant, you know, once it comes out of your storage tank, goes in through your treatment process and enters your potable storage tank, I mean raw storage, uh, storage tank at the beginning, then from that point on, the piping that serves your buildings, all that's your distribution system. So throughout that distribution system, you are required to maintain a chlorine residual. And there are minimum levels for that. Uh, free chlorine, for instance, is a 0.2 milligrams per liter, which is very low. Uh, if you're using chloramine disinfection uh, or disinfectant, uh, you have to maintain a 0.5 uh, chloramine residual. So chlorine bleach solution is recommended to disinfect water in the system where rainwater is the only source of treated water. Uh, so treated when you, when you have treated rainwater, we have a lot of systems that are a lot of businesses that want to combine their sources. So if you're using rainwater, you can treat it with uh, free chlorine, but some systems may have another source of water that has chloramine, uh, chloraminated water. So when you're blending it, 
It may require, when you bleed in different types of sources of disinfectants, it may require the use of another disinfectant or combination of disinfectants to avoid tasting other problems caused by mixing chlorinated water and chloraminated water. So when we talk about chloraminated water, chlorinated water is just strictly using free chlorine, straight bleach or you know uh, gas chlorine, that type of thing. Chloraminated water is when you're using, uh, when you talk about chloramines or chloraminated water, chloramine disinfectant is formed in water treatment surface and groundwater, because some groundwaters, you may have to use a uh, chloramine disinfectant as well. Uh, when you add chlorine and ammonia to form chloramines. And a lot of the reason that uh, surface water treatment plants, I'm talking large ones, they use chloramine disinfectant. Uh, it lasts longer, but it's, uh, the biggest reason is when you have a surface water supply, you're not gonna be faced with that, as far as I can see on rainwater. But in source water, like lakes, streams, you have a lot of organic material. So when you have total organic carbon in the water, straight chlorine reacts with that organic carbon and it creates a disinfection byproduct, which is regulated by EPA and TCQ. And so when you add chlorine and ammonia, that chemical reaction or combination uh, just doesn't react with that organic carbon. So that's a lot of the reason in Texas that most of your surface water plants, you will see them using chloraminated or chloramine uh, disinfectant, uh, just because it's so much easier to uh, avoid that uh, those disinfection byproducts by using that uh, chlorine and ammonia uh, disinfectant combination. And uh, it just doesn't react with that total organic carbon. And because you, the, the disinfection byproducts are regulated with a maximum contaminant level. So if you're using straight chlorine and you're using surface water, out of a lake or a stream, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to have high disinfection byproducts in your distribution system. So that's the reason they're using chlorine water. So on your minimum capacity requirements, uh, they cover the, the production, the treatment, the storage, and pressure maintenance facilities. All that can be found in uh, 30 TAC 29045. And they just assure, and TCQ requires that, that, that the public water system is able to provide adequate quantities of drinking water. Uh, so there are also some underlying principles that control the capacity of the rainwater collection, treatment, storage, and pressure maintenance facilities. Some of those are the roof and storage reservoir. It must be large enough to capture and store enough untreated water to provide an adequate reserve during periods when there is limited rainfall. So that's something to consider when you're designing a rainwater collection system. Uh, TCQ is going to require, and your public water system and you're regulated, TCQ is going to require that you have enough capture capability to provide water uh, to your customers. And especially if you may be classified as a, most of these that I see are not a community water system, but they wanna ensure that you still have capacity, adequate capacity requirements. So the treatment facilities, or the combination of all the treatment facilities, if rainwater is a supplement to other sources, they must be capable of treating enough water to meet the customer's maximum daily demands on the day when they use the most water. So they gotta meet the maximum daily demand, your capacities have to meet the maximum daily demand, and they have to meet the peak demand during the time of the day when the most water is used. So TCQ not only requires you to meet the maximum daily demand of any day in the year, but they require you to also meet a peak demand, which could be during any day. You may have one day that could be your uh, maximum day, but your peak demand could have occurred on another, another day. So operations and maintenance, all public water systems that treat surface water must be under the direct supervision. So this is another thing, you have to have a license or class C or higher surface water license uh, individual overseeing your system. So if you use cartridge or membrane filters, other class C water works operators are allowed, but that's only if they have completed a surface water training and are familiar with the monitoring and reporting requirements for surface water plants. So the licensed operator must be present at the plant. So keep this in mind, if you, you're gonna have to have an operator at the plant when that plant is treating water. If you don't, then you have to have the plant that has to be equipped with the continuous monitors, alarms, and shutoffs to assure that it, if a malfunction occurs, it does not occur when the operator is not present. Or if it occurs, they can, they can immediately respond to it. Operator does not have to be at the water plant when rainwater is being harvested from the roof or when treated water is being delivered to customers. However, 
they have to be there when it's treated. If, when the, if that plant is running and treating water, they have to be there. So most of that's going to happen simultaneously. I started not to put that last bullet point in there, but that was part of some TCQ guidance. But, uh, but basically when the plant is treating water, an operator has to be there. Or if not, they have to have a plant with the automatic plant shutdown and have to have continuous monitors so they can notify that operator when there's either a turbidity spike or a, a low chlorine residual. So all those kind of uh, issues have to be able to be, you have to monitor those type of conditions and that operator has to be notified if any of those uh, conditions uh, present themselves. So rainwater sources must meet the same monitoring reporting requirements as all other public water systems that use surface water. So you can go to the, a huge surface water treatment plant at a city the size of a million population. And if you have 300 at your event center that you're treating uh, rainwater for, you have to meet the same requirements. It may not be, it's gonna be scaled down, but you're gonna have to meet the same monitor requirements as a large municipality. Other matters that must be addressed when developing and operating a public water system with rainwater source include the submittal and approval of a concentration time study for the system. So the CT study is basically documenting where you add your disinfectants and you have, and you prove in the TCEQ that you have a, uh, you're providing enough viral inactivation for, and also physical removal for crypto and GRD. So that's what the a concentration time study does. It's really looking at your disinfectant. It's telling them, hey, at this point we've injected chlorine. So it goes through our storage tank. It has uh, contact time in that storage tank. We know based on that, here's a number. You have to maintain this certain residual, but that's what a CT study is. It basically tracks your disinfection system through your treatment process. And it's a formalized approved process that TCQ will send back to you and, uh, and say, okay, this process that you propose is approved. Uh, then you can start treating you know, in accordance with that CT study. Uh, TCQ requires that you have an effective cross-connection control program. That's just to make sure that you don't recontaminate your water after it's been distributed. You know, if you have some type of uh, facilities out there that could you know, have backflow or back siphonage, that's what they want you to, to assess as well and make sure that you have a, like I said, a cross connection control program in place. The maintenance of a completed, uh, incomplete record, operating records for its, you have to fill out a, what TCQ terms as a service water monthly operating report. Now that CT study that you see at the top, those parameters that you have, your operating parameters, because that's what that CT study, CT study does. It determines your operating parameters for your treatment process. That surface water monthly operating report reports on that, your actual operating conditions, you know, you're monitoring for disinfectant residuals, turbidity, whatever is included in that CT study, you have to report to show TCEQ that, hey, we're meeting those parameters based on our approved CT study. Operations and maintenance, uh, so you have to provide a monitoring plan that identifies all your chemical and bacteriological monitoring locations throughout your water system. Uh, you have to have an operations manual that describes how your system is designed, operated, and maintained. It includes all these processes that we've discussed. So in our operations and maintenance, uh, implementation of, a, like I said, a, an effective cross-connection control program. So as TCQ just emphasizes this, I know we kind of mentioned this already, but it says it's especially important for rainwater which rainwater can be very corrosive if not properly treated. And then you have to have maintenance of a supply of critical parts, equipment, reagents, chemical feed equipment. You have to have redundancy in your chemical feed equipment, uh, replacement cartridges for any type of cartridge filters that you're utilizing. Uh, you have to have a turbidimeter, a spare turbidimeter, as a matter of fact. So that's what you monitor your uh, turbidity with. And uh, other essential laboratory equipment, you're gonna have to have pH meters, you're going to have to have, uh, you know, uh, disinfectant residual monitors. So all that has to have the proper standards, reagents, and, uh, you know, your calibration logs and everything else has to go with all those type of instrumentation. So most of the contaminants present in, in roof-based harvested rainwater are introduced during its collection, storage, and distribution, which most of you obviously are aware of that. TCQ regulates more than 100 different constituents and requires public water systems to monitor these and other contaminants that can be present in drinking water. So just some quick on your drinking water quality. There are two major regulated categories, organic chemicals. You have organics, which are basically contaminants that are typically introduced when water comes in contact with materials containing refined organic products, and you have your synthetic organic chemicals. 
and they're usually found in pesticides, herbicides, and uh, similar manufactured products. Volatile organic chemicals, uh, you could hear, I know when I was, uh, years ago, I was uh, working in the underground storage tank uh, program, and uh, volatiles are something you're gonna have, uh, you know, of course, gasoline, uh, benzene, uh, that's gonna be a volatile organic, so TCQ tests for that. You know, some wells in smaller systems, they may have a, they could still have an underground storage tank, so all those type of chemicals are monitored uh, and if they become, or if they are a problem or found, they may put you, they're going to require treatment for those, uh, those chemicals, for those contaminants. And so like I said, there's two regulated categories, inorganic chemicals. Minerals, they typically do not pose a public health threat, but are regulated because they degrade aesthetic qualities. Those would be like iron, uh, most of the time iron and uh, sulfates, you know, chlorides, those type of things, total dissolved solids, uh, those can really create some issues with uh, aesthetic quality. Metals, uh, arsenic, those are some of your metals they're talking about. They degrade aesthetic quality, and they also pose a public health threat in enough high enough concentrations if they exceed the maximum contaminant level. Uh, so then you can get into your, your total chloroforms. Was there a group of bacteria that are widespread in nature? They're ubiquitous in the environment, and they're useful as an indicator of fecal contamination. So most of the labs in Texas, when you take a bacteriological sample in, which you're required to monitor, monthly, uh, you, the, the lab will analyze for total coliform, and if it's positive, then obviously they, they, uh, they test for E. coli. And E. coli is a species of fecal coliform bacteria that's specific to fecal material from humans and other warm-blooded animals. Of course, EPA recommends E. coli as the best indicator of health risk from water contact and recreational waters. E. coli is the bad boy. Coliform bacteria are tested for a sur as a surrogate for pathogenic bacteria. So public wa water systems, they, they got to collect samples for total coliform and E. coli uh, as sample collection schedule that are representative of water throughout the distribution system. So all water systems are required to collect monthly bacteriological samples. And uh, they do that on a monthly basis. And the number of samples per month is based on their population SIR. So typically, if you're, for most of the small systems like most of you, I think, are dealing with. If you're below 1,000 population, you're only going to have to collect one bacteriological sample from your distribution system per month. And that's just your distribution. I mean, you're going to have a lot more other monitoring requirements on your actual treatment process. So pathogenic viruses that were parasites are difficult and expensive to test for, and a minimum treatment technique requirement has been established to help ensure that treated drink water is free of these public health threats. So that's why you have the treatment tech requirements. Remember, we said we had disinfectants we used. But TCQ requires these minimum treatment requirements for the removal of, uh, of these type of constituents. So you hit, if you treat surface water or rainwater, you've got to meet these minimum tra treatment technique requirements. You have to provide a four log removal or inactivation of viruses. Remember that's a 99.99% removal. Three log removal of inact or inactivation of Giardia. And based on, for Cryptosporidium, all, uh, TCQ requires that you do a source water assessment to determine if you've got crypto present. And based on that, they, they basically put you in a bin, a class bin. So they may require you to provide a two log, four log, five or 5.5 log inactivation or removal of Giardia based on your source water treatment or source water assessment. We're done. Well, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> okay. So everybody, um, Thank you all for listening to James. I wanted to go over some questions. I know that was a lot of information. Uh, so um, James, the first question I wanna ask you is a lot of folks on this call are from Texas, but there's also a lot of folks that are not from Texas. So how does the information that you just discussed apply to those folks nationally, perhaps? So most information went over today. Uh, as far as the, you know, inactivation ratios, that type of thing, those are EPA requirements. So uh, as far as the actual removal process uh, for treating uh, surface water or rainwater, uh, that's an EPA requirement. So uh, the states are going to follow that uh, same removal process, uh, the same. They, they're going to have some different capacity requirements uh, associated with their specific uh, state requirements. But as far as the actual uh, treatment of surface water, that's an EPA requirement. So 
the vast majority of states in the, have adopted the EPA requirements. Okay, and then the other thing is, you know, a lot of folks work on residential water systems versus say a commercial system, which is really right. what you were talking about. Can you give us that definition one more time so we can really understand the difference between sure. when you have to in Texas be a public water supply? So uh, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, none of these requirements apply to you unless you meet that definition of a public water system. And that's if you serve 15 connections or serve 25 people at least 60 days out of the year. So if you're just a residential, uh, if you have rainwater collection system at your residence, uh, you know, you're not regulated by TCQ. Uh, you have to meet that definition of a public water system first, and that's serving at least 15 connections or you serve 25 people at least 60 days out of the year. Okay, so, so for example, I live in Dripping Springs. Um, down the road, there used to be a place called Tank Town. Uh, they bottle rainwater. Are, are they a public water supply? Yes, if a uh, uh, bottling facilities, the fact because they're providing water to multiple customers, you know, through bottled water, uh, they have to meet the TCQ requirements for an activation for basically service water. Uh, and I was involved with that uh, particular project, you know, initially uh, and was aware of it, but they have to meet the, all the inactivation ratios for service water treatment. And then if they remove the chlorine or whatever, once it enters the building through their bottling uh, process, that's usually regulated by a state health department, mm -hmm. the local uh, health department. So if they had to meet the, the TCQ requirements as far as service water treatment first before it goes into the bottling process. And then, then that's usually regulated by FDA or uh, the particular state health department. Uh, but, and that's the reason they meet that definition is because they're providing that bottled water to multiple customers. Okay. So uh, TCQ regulates that treatment process in a bottling facility. Perfect. Um, it looks like uh, some of y'all may have typed in some questions. So I'm gonna run through some quick questions before we turn it over to our next speaker. Um, Alex says, what chlorine residual would you recommend if you blended rainwater with well water versus city water? Okay, so the, the minimum disinfectant residuals that you're required to maintain, those are straightforward. Uh, depending on what type of disinfectant you're using. Like I mentioned earlier on, whether you're using uh, straight chlorine or using chloramine disinfectant, 0.2 milligrams per liter is required throughout your distribution system for just straight chlorine disinfectant. And if you're using chloramines or ammonia and chlorine combination, then a 0.5 milligrams per liter is required uh, throughout your distribution system uh, for chloramine disinfectants. Uh, so that's a, that's a straightforward, I mean, that's a, uh, minimum uh, disinfectant residual, regardless of whether it's a, you know, if you're a public water system, then you have to maintain that minimum uh, disinfectant residual. And it's 0.2 milligrams per liter for chlorine disinfectant and 0.5 for uh, chloramine disinfectant. Okay. All right. And I don't want to take up all the questions here and see if there's anybody else. And if you just want to ask a question, I know a lot of folks are shy and bashful. Uh, you can unmute your mic if you'd like to ask a question at this point. Let's see, Ann Van Giesen says, how often should turbidity be measured? Okay, that's going to vary on the type of system, but uh, typically like uh, you will have to have online monitor equipment for your turbidity. And uh, most of the time that's gonna be daily for these type of systems. Uh, they're gonna be classified as probably a transient water system. I mean, you first have to meet that definition of a public water system. Then the most ones that I've been involved with are a transient because they're serving a transient customer population. What does transient mean? Uh, you have a transient population. So, so they're you, coming and going? Yeah, they're or? coming and going all the time, like restaurants, uh, uh, you know, wineries, breweries, tasting rooms, that type of thing, where you actually have a transient customer population that's uh, consuming the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's through hand washing, you know, uh, drinking water or, you know, if they're washing glassware, that type of thing. So all those definitions fall under human consumption and drinking water definition. So, uh, but typically it's going to be at least daily, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the size of the system. And uh, that varies, you know, municipalities, they're monitoring every, they have turbometers or tur uh, turbometers that monitor every 15, uh, you know, every 15 minutes. So it, it varies on the size of the system and uh, through the exception process through TCT. Okay. But most of these are going to be minimum of daily. Um, and then Bob has a question for you. It says, 
what is the training requirement for managing a chlorine system? Does your standard differentiate between stormwater and rainwater? No, uh, so the type of system that you are, uh, you're classified with your groundwater or service water, that's gonna dictate what type of uh, water operator you're required to have. Uh, so for instance, if you're just a groundwater system and uh, you're providing water uh, and you're a public water system uh, and you're transient, you typically in Texas, you don't, you're not required to have an operator. However, if you're using rainwater as your source, then you're required to have the sea service operator just because the, the uh, advanced level of treatment that's required. So TCQ requires you to have at least a sea service operator license or another sea type license, but you also have to have that service water training uh, if you're providing rainwater for a potable water uh, source or for, for potable water. Okay. Hope that answers the question. I hope that did too. Bob, if, if that didn't answer your question, if you could ask more or chime in, we'd be happy to address that further. So I have just a couple more questions. Um, it seems like rainwater, especially in Texas, requires what we call an exception in order to get a system like that approved through TCQ. Can you give me a little bit of insight of what that takes and possibly how long that takes? I, I assume it'd be similar in other states if right. they allow exceptions <clears throat> to the rule. So TCQ, uh, when you talk about rainwater uh, collection for using it for potable water source and your public water system, uh, TCQ uh, considers that innovative treatment. So they require an exception. And basically what it's, it's, it's giving them time to look at the, you know, the type of treatment you're going to be using before you actually submit your engineering plans. So that, uh, that review process is 100 days. And then once that 100 days is uh, finished, then you submit your actual engineering plans for your treatment process. But uh, TCQ requires uh, or considers, uh, you know, uh, rainwater collection or treatment of rainwater sources as innovative treatment. So then they require you to submit an exception basically outlining your treatment process first, and then that gives them time to vet out if there's any other additional requirements based on your uh, collection system as far as your capture system, uh, catchment system. So they look at all that, and then that gives them time to evaluate any other type of constituents you may be required to monitor for. So that they require to go through an exception process, which is a 100-day process first, and then you submit your engineering plans for your treatment process, which that basically adds on another 60 days uh, before you get approval to construct that water system. And then uh, once that construction process is finalized, then the engineer resubmits sort of the final plans, concurrent saying, hey, we've, we've uh, developed this system, we designed or built this system in accordance with our plans, and that's another 60 days. Okay. So but you're looking at you know, six to eight months for sure as far as the final uh, total review process, review and approval process. See if there's any more questions. We just have a few more minutes. Looks like we've covered every question. So I guess my last question is, and you know, folks, uh, James' email is up on the screen. So please write that down. If you do decide you're gonna do rainwater system in Texas, he would be the best expert to work with um, on a public water supply. So James, the last question I have for you is, tell me what you're doing now. So you were working with TCQ, obviously you've become a subject right. matter expert. Uh, what are you doing now and how can folks work with you? So now we're uh, also, I'm a licensed operator. So I operate some small water systems uh, in and around Dripping Springs area. And of course, I'm working with you on uh, design and uh, uh, installation of some uh, small public water systems. Uh, so that's what I do. I, I work with Christy and I work with an engineer and a water well driller. So if we're using a groundwater source, obviously we go through the TCQ exception process and, uh, and the approval process uh, to get those water systems approved. And uh, that carries us through the design phase, the construction phase, and the final operational uh, phase as well. So that's what I'm doing now, uh, working with, consulting with other uh, water systems on, on various uh, compliance issues uh, from, you know, small water systems to municipalities. So that's what I'm doing now. So I've kind of sort of covered the gamut as far as uh, design and uh, uh, construction of water systems and uh, the compliance side of it as well. So I'm really focused on the compliance side of it. So that's uh, help water systems once we get them constructed, uh, get them up and running mm -hmm. to be able to monitor their system uh, in accordance with TCQ regulations and make sure they're, you know, have all their monitoring reports, uh, all their uh, monitoring requirements in place. So they're, they can uh, you know, have an effective uh, 
you know, operation and maintenance of the water system. Perfect. And uh, Jim, um, I do not see the second question from Bob. So I apologize uh, if you could unmute and help me find that for James, that would be greatly appreciated. Got it. Yeah. Bob says, uh, I'm confused. Why are you requiring rainwater uh, such as uh, water coming off the roof, the same requirements as surface water or storm water? So uh, TCQ, uh, that's a, that's a requirement that they have. And I know that it's not exactly the same, but the fact that it is, can be uh, come into contact with other contaminants, you know, from, you know, uh, animals, that type of thing on roof systems. So they look at the, the four log, three log and the two log and activation process. So TCQ actually requires the same level of treatment just because of the uh, potential for uh, to enter that rainwater collection system. And it's basically your, your roof, uh, roof system that, uh, you know, is subject to other contaminants. So that's why they have this level of treatment required for uh, rainwater collection uh, or rainwater as a source for potable water. Uh, it's not exactly the same, obviously, as a uh, service impoundment, you know, from service water, uh, but they do require uh, the same level of treatment uh, just because of the potential uh, for contamination, you know, from uh, roof-based collection systems. And just to clarify that, is that only, we're only talking about public water supplies, where humans exactly are going right. to be consuming the water. We're not talking about storm water <clears throat> management, where you're just detaining the water or right, looking that, at water quality um, issues, where you're releasing it after you capture it. Right, it's that, a totally different subject yeah, matter. Yes, totally different subject matter, right. Okay. This is it only if you're using rainwater collection system to provide potable water, and if you meet the definition of a public water system. If you're, this is just a residential, uh, facility, uh, then, uh, then you're not regulated by TCQ. This is only if you're a, deemed to be a public water system based on the number of connections that you're serving or the number of people that you're serving, uh, you know, 25 people at least 60 days out of the year. So Bob, hopefully that answers your question and you're welcome to email James as well. Again, his email address is listed on this slide. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? If not, I'm going to hand it back over to Jim. Thanks, David. Thanks, guys. <laughs>